Uh, well, hello everybody, my name is Paul Egan, uh, I'm from a company called Newell, uh, we're a, um, I'll go through introductions in a second, but just as a little footnote, um, I also used to work for CCL many, many years ago before I joined CSR as one of the original kind of uh, early team there, so I'm very familiar with all the kind of Bluetooth stuff we've got there. So tonight, I'd like to talk to you about some of the connectivity challenges that seem to come up from the floor here when we were talking earlier on. So we've all talked about Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and short range, I'm going to try and talk to you about why we think wide area networks are going to win in connectivity for internet things. So we'll go for a quick introduction, uh, a little bit of background on how we see the internet things in the market and I will be using the B word of several billion later on, so I'll just get that out straight away. We'll look at all the different kinds of connectivity and where we think the battleground for wireless is really going to be and we think it's going to be in standards and spectrum particularly. So introductions so again I'm Paul Egan I've been with Newell since the very start uh, a number of us left CSR in 2010 to start Newell we're a venture pack startup uh, we've been going exactly four years on Tuesday this week um, for the first part of our life we spent a long time looking at TV white space because we thought that the match of this lovely uh, spectrum resource that was going to become available free to everybody was going to be the, the kind of killer app for this TV white space as we found, deregulation hasn't happened fast enough, so we've had to find other spectrum resources, which is why we're now looking at uh, all of the ISM bands, the kind of Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, 2.4s and sub-gigahertz stuff, but particularly the bet we're really making is on what we've done uh, with the cellular guys. So to that end, about a year ago, we performed a pivot on where we had been with TV white space and said, right, we need to do something else. So now really our focus, and I really wish I'd brought a clicker with me, um, was that we're looking at how we can reuse existing cellular networks that are already out there. Um, again, I'll talk you through that. There's a little bit of technology in there, but not a great deal, so I've, I've made it quite, hopefully quite tech light. So, when we started in 2010, this was the best thing we had to describe the Internet of Things. Now, many of you have probably seen this before. It comes from uh, Robin J. Woolley at uh, Beecham Research, and it's very, very good. So. I'd like you to pay attention because there will be questions on this later. So you can see it's, a, it's, it's still, in a lot of ways, it's still no less confusing now as to what the Internet of Things really is. But I'm trying to expand upon where I think we're, we're, we're ending up wanting to play. So we have numbers from all the different guys that say 20 billion, 50 billion, a trillion, a gazillion billion. doesn't matter what numbers they are. We've got numbers to support how all of these things are going to be. And the sorts of device we'll be looking at, I've got some toys there that I can uh, show later on. But really, we see three classes of device. So traditional M2M would be things such as smart metering, basically anything that really can support the cost of a SIM, the power requirements for a SIM, and possibly the need to have kind of global um, deployment where you just want to put something in a product, send it anywhere in the world, you switch it on and it will just work. We've then got a subset of that, which is the connected devices, which some of those could be using connectivity type technologies they're assuming you've got a handset or you've got Wi-Fi available or you've got a connectivity that's all, the infrastructure's been built for you, you don't have to do that. And then really for us, the kind of long tail is the inter Internet of Things. And for us, these are really large numbers of devices that will send very small amounts of data at pretty scheduled times. But for us, our thought is this really needs to be a wide area technology, so you don't have to rely on infrastructure being built out there. It's going to have to be an order of magnitude cheaper for the modules than cellular is at the moment, and it's going to have to be probably a hundred times cheaper in terms of the service offering you're going to have to pay an operator to actually use these things. And if we look at some of the numbers associated with this, we'd say that at the top you've got maybe something that's using maybe five megabytes of data a month, and you might pay five dollars a month for that kind of SIM card. And there will be, you know, a couple of billion of those type devices. As we move further down, you can see that we're going to get to this kind of billion number here, and that who knows where that number's going to be. But this is the important one. We'll be looking at these kind of charges per year for uh, a wide area service connected to these things with modules very similar to this one that are going to be in the kind of 3 to $5 range, something like that. Whereas at the moment, cellular connectivity could cost you 10 15 20 whatever the numbers are. We're looking at getting the numbers right down on that. <coughs> oh, sorry. Yep. Yes, you're right. Sorry. Because the, the, num yes, the big numbers come up. So, from the, from the numbers we've got, uh, we've done a lot of uh, work with machine research, and they, their numbers are really bottom up. So, they've looked at markets for just about everything that could possibly have connectivity in. And just an example, we've got stuff here this um, looking at putting, as Tim said, putting connectivity into things that don't necessarily have electricity. 
So this is the world's smartest mouse trap. So the idea here is, well, I don't know if you guys have seen this before, so the videos are online for this, is um, poor little mousy mouse runs along through the hole here. In here are a couple of photo uh, diodes with a sensor. As it crosses the beam, fires a little solenoid, closes the mouse trap, punctures a little CO2 canister. Oh. <laughs> Very humane. What would you rather? <laughs> would you rather would, so would you rather stamp on it or do you send a cat in or something like that? So you can see now that this kind of device has to be built for about $5. So is this really going to support an LTE modem and all the rest of the stuff? And the only way these guys know this thing's gone off at the moment is they send a man round every day to look at the LED. And if the LED's flashing, he has to replace it. So you can see how these kind of things are going to change the kind of business model. To take it one stage even further, how about the humble soap dispenser? So the idea in here is that these guys know that there's approximately 500 pumps of um, soap in there to actually empty the soap dispenser. So we, we run this as a demo. All we've literally done is just hook up a little reed switch onto that there. And we have to use this as, as we go about. So this will enable guys to be a, a full understanding of exactly the status of all their assets in the field. And this is just one example. I mean, you can look at all these different kind of applications. But looking at this, kind of, these are the kind of things we're talking about. This is the long tail of the Internet of Things. These are very small, these devices and very small amounts of data, but they have to be incredibly cheap. But these things are always going to be in places that are going to be quite challenging when it comes to radio connectivity. Where are we coming? So we think there's, a re there's definitely a revenue opportunity there for people that want to become operators in this kind of space. Uh, but it's got to be more on the connectivity. But really, you've got to be able to offer super cheap. And when I mean cheap, the numbers there that we're talking about is literally, if I could get 50 cents a year from these devices, I'd be very happy as a kind of service for that. Now, just to really iterate that, if we look at how we're seeing um, how data is being consumed at the moment, unfortunately, I've picked the wrong colours there. So you can see that there's increasing throughput from the smartphones there with the numbers of those things. We've got M2M -M devices there, and at the very far end, we've got mobile broadband. So there are a few people that will use the cellular network for their home uh, broadband connection. If we look at what we think IoT is going to do, there's going to be a massive increase in the attach rate. But just the amount of data these things are sending is going to be tiny. So, so a lot of the existing networks that are out there just are not really fit for purpose for the kind of things that we actually want to support. So for us, we're looking at average throughput could be one ten thousandth of a smartphone every month. You know, this, you could have devices that send 10 bytes per day. I mean, even to the point where some of this stuff, some of the dog collar things we've been looking at, they will only ever send data when there's a problem or when you actually want to use it. So that potentially changes the business model that, you know, you can deploy these things and you only get charged for them when the data is actually valuable. Given that as well, that some of the queries for this data you may have stored in some repository where you have it, the actual number of queries on that and the um, JSON you might send for that could be more than the actual billions of devices you've got. So you might have four very important bytes of data, but if it takes you a kind of 200 character string to request that data, then potentially a billion of these devices generating that amount of, that amount of extra data on the network. So you've got to look at how you can minimize access to just those, that kind of stuff. Then you've got the devices per customer. This is a really interesting one because if we look at the smartphone, traditionally, Almost each one of that is an individual that goes into a shop and buys that. What we're talking about here is people that will bring 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 connections with them. The user-based insurance is a great example. I mean, we've, we've got examples here where there could be millions of connections come from just one customer in one country. So you can see how just the scale of this thing actually distorts where we are at the moment as well. And also latency is going to be another interesting thing. So if your device can manage latencies of maybe five seconds, ten seconds, a minute, half an hour. You can see that can also change the dynamics of how you either build the network or the kind of specifications you have for that. However, there is a problem because you have to compete with free. And when we say free, that's everyone that has a smartphone in their pocket because you've already built the network for the guys that are developing the applications. And there's some examples there. However, if you really want to offer these kind of services, the guys that are already offering wide area services are already incumbent with buying Spectrum, running big, big services from Ericsson and NSN and people like that. They've got billing systems that no one is allowed to touch because if you do, the whole thing will fall over, as we saw last year with Orange. The whole thing just really needs to be turned on its head because we think there's just too much cost in there. And the fact is, if you're trying to compete with free, it's going to be really difficult. 
So here's a couple of examples of, of the way we like to look at things. Again, the colours probably aren't particularly good. If we look at what the connectivity choices are for some of these things, so we might have Wi-Fi in these kind of places. So metering for some things, maybe in the house, could be okay. You'll have an in-home display that can separate the data around there. That's, well, okay, you know, that's going to work. Maybe in the office environment, you may have devices that don't have any kind of user interface. If you want to hook up to the local Wi-Fi, how are you going to get a password in there? And then you might have things that are going to have no interface at all. They're going to need massive long battery life, but they're only going to chirp every now and again. So if we look at some of the challenges associated with that, again, we've got problems of actually getting coverage into these kind of challenging places. We've got the cost associated with them, and we've just got the cost of supporting these things. And if you've got you know, ten, if rent have 10,000 soap dispensers out there, they don't want to have to go and pair each one of these every time they take one out of one washroom and just put it straight back in. So again, this is just reinforcing where we think the argument for really true wide area is, is going to go. And again, to back up some numbers from our friends at Machina, their overall thoughts are there will be about 15 billion true Internet of Things connections by 2020. That's a bottom-up analysis. So a couple of billion of those are going to be uh, in existing cellular, and the rest are currently going to be blue C Sigby Wi-Fi. Choose any kind of connectivity flavor you want. If we scroll forward a little bit, and we see if there was a different way of doing wide area connectivity, where you really could get battery life measured in years, and when we say years, we mean kind of 10 years from one or two AA cells. If you really could get a module that is three dollars, something like that and you really could get this massive improvement in link budget for the radio. And we're, for those technical around you, we're looking at a 20 dB improvement over existing GPRS systems as it is. So that would give you the ability to get deep inside buildings to get to some of these assets. Machina have modelled this to say, well, not only could you capture you know, a few billion of those devices because it's going to be easier for you as application guys to deploy this, it also means that potentially you can start doing some of the applications that are going to need this stuff to be in place. And the really lovely bit that we really like is we think it's actually going to accelerate people deploying more kinds of IoT applications because the, the infrastructure and everything is already there to help you. Tim and his guys are going to show that there is a real business model there and there's real money to be made in that. If we can provide this part of connectivity to make it even easier again, then we can see it just improves the whole thing. So that's the really background. So let's look at the kind of choices we've got at the moment. So we've got existing cellular pick any flavour you like, including uh, a standard that's been worked on called MTC, where 3GPP are taking the LTE specification and they're trying to rip out the guts of as much as possible. So it's going to be low data rate, it's going to be single antenna, it's going to be narrow channel weights, it's going to be all the stuff they're going to try and rip out the chip. We still think they're going to struggle to get to a very low cost for that, but that, we'll, we'll come back to that later. If we look at what's happening in the unlicensed uh, wide area thing. We've got Sigfox, I'm sure you've probably all heard of that, they've been doing very well with a lot of the stuff that they're proposing. We've got some guys from uh, North London called N-Wave, they're uh, targeting the metering space. Um, Synaptic are a spin out from Plex Tech down in wherever they are, is it? Um, Register. Yeah. Um, they're looking at doing stuff in 868 for street lights. Again, so there's all these things coming out and we've got um, long range radio from um, Semtech as well. So they're all operating really in sub one gigahertz, so good propagation for the radio space, but they're all proprietary. None of them are open standards. The stuff on the end I'm sure you're all very familiar with and would probably base most of your applications on the moment. So if we look at these, tried and tested, very good. It's there, it just works as long as you've got kind of access to infrastructure. Cellular's there, but it's expensive. You don't get very good battery life. Uh, and the fact is you've got global coverage, but you're gonna pay for it. These guys in the middle, it sounds really good. It's all it's untested technology. We don't know if it's going to work at scale. Uh, there's not been enough big deployments there. So again, we you know we think there is definitely a place for license exempt in a lot of this stuff. But a lot of the bets we're making is basically working in license space. So we are backing a standard called Cellular IoT, which we'll come on to in a second. But in essence, if we look at the challenges we have for Spectrum, which is where we think some of the really some of the, the battlegrounds going to be for it. We started looking at TV white space. We thought it was going to be a great spectrum resource. We thought it was going to be sub gigahertz, loads of it all over the place, available everywhere. Hasn't panned out that way. It's um, available in the US, in Singapore. UK is probably going to get it towards the end of next year, but that could slip into 2016. The EU already has um, a program to look at what they're going to do with the UHF band. So there's just too much uncertainty there for us. 
Then in the middle of last year, we started looking at this cellular IoT. It's a great idea, but we have to get the standards bodies on board, we have to get operators, we have to get vendors, we have to get everyone to say this is really what we want to do, and that itself is in no, that's no small feat. And then license exempt. We think that's a good idea for some applications, but it's going to mean a complete new infrastructure build. So these networks are going to have to be built from scratch, so you're going to have to find backhaul, you're going to have to have sites to put antennas, you're going to have to do a complete new build out. And then obviously there's obviously some um, issues there around harmonisation, around standards. So which standard would you have in Europe, which standard would you have in North America, would you have in the Far East, and so on and so forth. So if we look at just a quick snapshot of the kind of frequency bands we've got here, uh, I'm only going to really look at the, license, uh, the sub 1 gigahertz because we think that's really what you need for license exempt. There's a bunch of stuff in the kind of 7, 800 megahertz, and the red stuff shows where you could operate in a license exempt. But guess what? There's an awful lot of blue stuff up there that's actually licensed to operators currently. So we spent a long time, we spent four years analysing this as to where we're going to operate this, this wireless network. And I've got to say, it comes down to being an availability of spectrum globally in one band. And if you want to get economies of scale where you don't have to have different antennas, you don't have to have different filters on the module, it's going to have to be in, the, in that kind of space. And that's, that's really, that's the conclusion we've really come to. So there is some spectrum coming in uh, Europe. There's a chunk of 6 megahertz coming. It's not ratified in all places all the time. Uh, but you can see that some of these guys are operating in 868. There's a tiny amount of spectrum. It's 200 kilohertz, something like that. It's free for all. There's limits on power. There's limits on duty cycle. You can't just set up shop and say, I'm going to occupy all this spectrum and use it for myself. There's rules governing how you can do that. So we've got some issues there saying, well, if three people decide to run a network in 868 megahertz, how is that going to impact availability for everybody else? Is there going to be interference? Are you going to can you guarantee my message is going to get through? And how are you going to operate a downlink if you've only got a 10% duty cycle from the base station down to the device itself? So again, there's opportunities there, but we think there's other stuff you can do. So we've been working on what we've been calling the clean slate approach, where uh, we were invited by one of the mobile phone operators to have some input to a working group that contain most of the large <coughs> vendors and say, today's cellular is fabulous, it's got, you know, it's all the things that you've got there. So it's, it's rolled out globally. There's a price point where you're not really going to get to below for that. It's not very good with batteries. So really what you want is to have modern standards, a very cheap module, a fantastic improvement in link budget, and obviously 10 to 15 years on small battery power. If we could do that, if we could come to that up of a magic hat, it would be fantastic. So guess what we did? We decided we were going to go for a cloud-based system where a lot of the components are going to be based on open source. So we don't have to necessarily use expensive licensed software from the Ericsson's and the Huawei's and the NSN's and stuff like that. There's lots of examples out there of people that run very large enterprises on a lot of open source um, software, particularly for things like high availability clustering, spinning up machines as you need. You don't have to have a dedicated data, data center for that. It's no surprise that coming out of CSR, um, we have a fantastic chip team that has been able to develop a chip for that will probably be about 90 cents, probably about a dollar or so by the time it's in the package, which means that we will be able to build modules just like this for probably about three dollars. And then obviously with our friends in CSR and the other chip makers around the world, hopefully they will see this is a billion chip opportunity and they will follow suit in there. So we're going to make this an open standard as well. So we're not after any kind of proprietary thing. We just think we're going to innovate slightly quicker and slightly better than anyone else to stay ahead. As far as the link budget goes, we've really gone back to kind of textbooks from the 1940s and 1950s and looked at what are the standards that we could use or what are the techniques we could use. They're out of patent. There's no essential IP royalties to pay on them that can give us a really good, solid, robust modulation scheme for these things. And again, we don't use anything fancy. We don't use OFDM. We just use a single carrier. Um, and we can pulse shape the individual radios so we know we don't get interference on the adjacent channels. So we've done a lot of stuff there to improve link budget for the radio. And of course, um, with our friends at ARM, we've been working on uh, an ARM co-processor to go with this, and just the ARM ticking away, uh, just looking at there, we can get 32 years from two AA cells at the moment. That's with the radio off, so that's not reporting. <laughs> so how are we going to do this? Well, if we look at the way that GSM networks are deployed at the moment, so operator comes along, buys a chunk of spectrum, there's a chunk for uplink, a chunk for downlink. That's then subdivided down into these subcarriers of 200 kilohertz each. What we're proposing is, is you take one of those subcarriers out of the spectrum that's been allocated to 
the operator and then we subdivide that down again into very very narrow channels so you have a downlink from the base station down to the device. Now it will mean some frequency replanning for the operators themselves but it shouldn't mean they have to deploy any new hardware. This will be a soft upgrade to existing networks that are actually in the field. So I'll leave you to think about that for a minute. And if you don't like it in GSM, if you're in the US, we've also got the ability to do it in LTE networks as well. So we know that when you buy your 10 megahertz of LTE spectrum from the government, 500 kilohertz either end of the band has to be left as a guard band. Well, we're pretty confident from all the work we've done and the, the measuring and the mitigation strategies we've got for being able to completely pulse shape these radios, that we can fit our entire downlink or uplink about 180 kilohertz of that band there. So we've actually still got band, we've still got guard band on either side of those particular things. Yeah. I've got some more technical slides on that, but I decided to leave those out for the audience. So clean slate is not just pie in the sky. It's got the backing of the names you can see there. It's a study item currently in GRAM, uh, and we will be running trials towards the end of this year with one operator, and we'll be running other trials uh, starting in the early part of next year as well. So we've actually got to the point where we've got engagement with vendors, we've got engagement with operators, and all this stuff is uh, coming along nicely. And again, you'll see this go through the standards uh, body as we take on. So, what are we saying then? So conclusions for the kind of way you might want to uh, hook this stuff up wirelessly. License exempt, LAN PAN stuff. If you've got a handset-centric application, such as a wearable or something like that, absolutely fantastic. Very good. Uh, it's good for in-home stuff. It's free spectrum, it's high bandwidth, you're going to take this stuff off, you might be able to charge it, and some of these things can be low power. You've already got quite a large ecosystem of people that are developing these kind of radios for a long time, so you're very, very low end cost at these kind of things at the moment. Um, and they're usually recognised, stable standards, open, so there's going to be no IP costs in there. However, the cons are, you are relying on someone else building the network for your device to talk to first, be that a handset or a Wi-Fi access point or whichever particular flavour you want. RF output power of these things is not particularly high, so it's only going to be tens of metres between there and your access point. Also some issues about coverage, getting through walls, getting through buildings, stuff like that. So again, these are come, uh, as you go further up the gigahertz range, it gets harder, but hopefully as you go lower down, it gets better. Um, and of course, fantastic. So I, you go to the shop, you buy this particular product, you get it home, you switch it on. How do you pair it to your Wi-Fi or to your optical thing? So again, there's some issues there around how you're going to provision these things. Do you have to have a smartphone to scan a barcode or a QR code that will then set all this kind of stuff up? We think all of this, for a lot of the stuff we're looking at for these kind of things, it's just too complicated. If you had a wide area connection in there, this thing would just suddenly chirp up, talk to the network, and it would just work. If we look at other license exempt wide area technologies, suitable for some applications, some metering stuff, Spectrum is generally free where it's available, but again, there's different bands in Europe, different bands in America, so building a single global module is going to be, could be a challenge there. Um, and it can be very low cost. You know, some of these radios are a dollar, something like that, and they can survive on you know, coin sales, as we've seen some of the stuff there. Mostly proprietary, so you're kind of a bit of a hostage to fortune there with you have to pick your operator, and those are the guys that are going to be in charge. It, this is not like a SIM-based thing where you can take the SIM out, swap operator if you suddenly find a better deal. Uh, these are going to require people to build brand new networks, greenfield sites as well. So that itself is not a particularly easy or cheap thing to do. Some of them have no downlink or limited downlink. So the chances of you being able to say, my message has definitely got through to the device, is going to be limited. So there are techniques that I've seen people employ where they'll send the same message five times, at random times, hoping the message gets through. Now, if you've got a billion of these things scattered around, there's going to be interference, there's going to be all kinds of, of things like that. So, um, and because there's very little or no downlink, it's, it's unlikely to be able to do in field firmware updates or update any security keys. So again, so there are opportunities there for that, um, but we can't see how it's going to really deliver against the kind of enterprise level, kind of service level agreement for that. So, so we think that low power wide area for this kind of cellular IoT thing is really the way to go. It is able to reuse existing networks that are out there at the moment. Uh, the MNOs have already got the channel, they've already got the brand, they've already got the reach and distribution. It uses a tiny amount of spectrum for each one of these guys, but yet could deliver uh, national networks to support, I think, somewhere in the region of 300 million devices in the UK, just, to, just using one uh, subcarrier from GSM at the moment. Um, there's no IP cost in the endpoint, so unlike paying 
royalty have patent holders to the Qualcomm's and the Nokia's and people like that. There's no, there's none of this kind of five dollars of a cellular module goes straight across to Qualcomm. That's we, we've taken really care of that. However, we are going to have to get industry support from this. It's going to take a lot of lobbying. It's going to take a lot of effort to get it through the standards body, but it is very disruptive, and it, we are doing it right now. So, in a nutshell, our plan is we're going to help develop the standards. We're going to develop a very, very cheap endpoint chip, and we're going to offer, where we're really going to make our money is offering cloud-based systems to support this inside of existing operators networks. And that's our three-point plan about what we're going to do. So, with that, any questions? Ah, I thought I'd go. Mm -hmm. uh, two questions. First of all, thank you. That, that's absolutely fascinating. We always see the public. First question, you said, Worldwide, we're going to send bands to people in that time. But if you slot them into the existing GSM networks, that's going to be a different frequency. It is, but there's, if you think of all the work that's been done in terms of antenna design for handsets at the moment, we can reuse so much of that already. So, and the fact is that we've already got a high performance radio, so we've got better link budgets, so we can trade the cost of having separate antennas for separate bands really in the ability to actually operate inside and in, in literally just build one module and it just gets shipped out. In the, in the same way a handset gets shipped from a uh, manufacturer now and you switch it on and it just works, we want to do exactly the same with these things. It's a great idea to a small amount of spectrum, so I've heard that, which is a great spectrum by the network. Yep. So is, is there a licensing issue there? Because my understanding is that when you're given not necessarily. Now, we've seen a lot of the rules change, particularly if you remember two or three years ago when EE or Orange, as they were in, the, in those days, decided they were going to re-farm their 1800 megahertz spectrum and put LTE into it. Now, there was a whole furore about them doing that, so you know, it's, it's technology dependent, it says so in the license here. Certainly in the UK, Ofcom are, rela are relaxing some of those conditions. As long as it's a recognised 3GPP or Etsy standard, then I believe in Europe you can deploy any technology into that particular spectrum. It's different in different locations, but again, we can see that with pull from the operators and from the vendors as well, the idea of having just a recognised standard operating on the network, we don't think is going to be a problem. What's in it for the network provider? <laughs> so I come along to you as an application guy, I say, right, I've got parking sensors. I've got 60,000 parking sensors to put in London. I don't want to pay $15 per parking sensor for a module. I don't want to pay $2 for a SIM card. And I don't want to pay $2 a month for that. So you can see that just from a cost perspective, the idea of having access to those kind of markets means that it will be able to grow the entire industry. So for them, cellular doesn't cut it for the soap dispenser and the mousetrap. Mm -hmm. And we can see those things. They, they acknowledge it themselves. Now, publicly, there's a... There's a bit of war of words going on at the moment about the fact is, you know, it'll all be GPRS. So don't, don't worry, guys, we'll take care of it. LTE will, be, LTE will come to the rescue. Privately, we hear differently. So there are people that, I mean, in the, this, the, there is, we can see there's movement there from just the other kind of wide area network, low power wide area networks that are operating in license exempt spectrum coming along. So you can see that there's going to have to be a response to, to something like that. And this is probably the easiest way to reuse the networks they've already got to be able to offer those kind of services at those kind of prices. Do all of the operators have to agree to pay this work? No. So no. In the you same can have some people who will. Yep. So let's look at the US. You've got operators out there that run CDMA networks. You've got operators out there that run GSM networks. You've got operators out there that run LTE networks. Um, depending upon your local regulation, if it says you can, here's the choice of technology you can run, you can deploy it in either one of those. Oh, by the way, we will not be deploying a CDMA in case of this. <laughs> yep. I don't know if you're aware of the good night app. I, I, know, of I, know, I know Alex very well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking to them, they were saying that it will work anywhere where there's a, a, a mobile signal. Yep. They don't use GSM, yep. but they're very cagey about the technology they use to, to switch that on and off. Do you know what that is? I do. You're not going to tell <laughs> He's not going to tell I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> um, I think one of your slides says you're using <coughs> IPv6 for transport. Uh, yeah, there will be. There is uh, an element of IPv6. We're actually looking at how we're going to use co-op as well. So potentially, there's, again, we, I've got a technical presentation that looks at how we get to 
whether it's an edge device and whether we use mirror proxies there for because these things are going to be really sleepy. So the idea this thing could go to sleep for months. So we've we've got a technical presentation that explains how we're actually going to do all that kind of stuff as well. It does. I, I, right. So that was one of the reasons we got involved in uh, creative weightless. So originally we thought there has to be a better way of delivering four or five bytes, not the 147 messages that LTE requires for setting up a connection. So, <coughs> so we, we have thought about that. You mentioned on one of the slides that only software upgrade on the base station yep. uh, stations will be required. Yep. But uh, uh, keeping in mind so big variety of different uh, kinds of base stations, old ones, new ones, and so on. How do you, uh, how are you planning to address this issue? Or uh, this equipment cannot be uh, capable of handling uh, narrow, narrow parts of the spectrum? <laughs> I hope we're still online. Um, um, so if you look at how a lot of modern networks are deployed, you basically have this multi-radio uh, remote radio head that can support 2G, 3G, LTE, all simultaneously. There's a lot of processing goes down actually in the baseband box at the bottom of the mask, but a lot of the radio stuff is actually, people don't touch that, you can basically scan the entire band, will suck all the radio signals in and the processing will be done down below. Now from what we've seen so far, because this is such a lightweight standard, the actual processing you need in the DSP code to actually be able to decode a lot of that stuff uh, fits within the specifications of what we've already seen for existing macro cell sites and for enode Bs. So there is some questions that we've, that we've got to ask about how uh, some of the small cell might end up doing this, where we've actually got smaller cells deployed. Um, but again, we've not seen um, any kind of problems with the, with the numbers we've actually been pushing through a lot of this stuff. Have you test ran such kind of test environment yeah. uh, to prove yeah, it's a yep. yep, so we've got, uh, we've done a load of modeling, we've got guys working with operators at the moment actually doing a bring up between the module and uh, a TAME base station. So that's actually ongoing at the moment. Chair, where else are you in your funding cycle? Are you <coughs> series one or what's, are you looking at additional funding? Or yep, so again, it's it's a big investment. So we're, we're very close to closing a deal soon. More on that later. Okay. Yeah, you, you have to last long enough for the networks to agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> very, it's, it's very interesting. The, the, the whole thing that the, the operator that invited us in had originally all the network vendors there, and there were proposals for evolution of LTE and this clean slate. And it just so happened that the clean slate looked very similar to the weightless stuff we'd been doing a couple of years ago. And someone said, oh, if you did that in here, wouldn't that give us an extra kind of opportunity to look here? And again, there was a paper published at the beginning of the early March, I think it was, that said, right, here's the opportunity for both evolution of LTE, you know, which gives you all the great things of, of you expect LTE to have in terms of bandwidth and uh, all the um, signaling, stuff like that. But there's also an opportunity for exactly these kind of things, and that's, that's why we were, we were invited to join that particular group. And what is the pricing model for the end users? So that's going to be down to your particular friendly operator. Uh, modules will be available to buy on the open market. So in the same way that you can go to Telit or uh, uh, Sierra Wireless or any one of your favorite module manufacturers, do a deal, get provisioning for that, uh, and away you go. As far as service level goes, we're, we are hoping that this will be in the cent range per year in terms of a service model for that. And what will be your key revenue driver out of that suite of services? Oh, services in the cloud. Basically taking care of all these particular things, provisioning them, uh, and actually making sure they're authenticated and can pop up anywhere in the world. I was just wondering how this uh, interacts with your work on weightless and uh, how this recent data with the pretty big things. Are they just all part of the same thing? Or yep, so very similar. What we've said is, for us, um, <coughs> weightless is really about license exempt. So that's a very much kind of white space license exempt play, whereas cellular IoT is definitely dedicated to uh, operate a license spectrum because we're going to have to go through the 3GPP Etsy GRAM space. So we are actually working in parallel with both of these things. The uh, Milton Keynes thing is coming along nicely. They've got the first couple of base stations in, I think, now. Uh, and we'll start to see stuff hooked up to the network there in the next few weeks. We are a small company. We have 30 people. <laughs> we have lots to do. And there is, a bit of sh there is a bit of focus we need to apply to these different things. At the moment, Milton Keynes, I wouldn't say it's finished, but it's 
it's in a pretty good state. It, we're now um, doing stuff with the application guys that are building the modules into the parking sensors and the smart bins and 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 and, and that kind of stuff. You're going to stick around after it? I, I can be here for another yeah, 20 minutes, half hour. Right. So I don't think I'll come to the pub though because I, okay. I have a pub quiz I need to get to. Exciting. All right. Thanks for speaking. <laughs>